Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Wiggle Wednesday. Uh, it's Troy with the Urban Worm Company. Uh, just me today. Steve is off uh, doing his pilot thing. So you guys are with me solo for this morning. Um, let me get my name up here. I always got to mess around with uh, switching things around. Uh, let me just click this so I can, you guys can make sure that you get my name. Uh, so today we have a presentation more for newbies. Uh, we're going to be going over how to prep a new bin for worms. Um, but we will give people a few minutes to get on here and uh, I can check out the comments. And just to remind everybody uh, that while I'm here by myself, uh, once I get into the presentation, I'm not going to be able to see comments. So please leave any questions and I will get to them at the end. I just won't be able to see them as I go along. Uh, because of the way that this stream works. But um, I've seen several people checking in so far. We've got Ed from Ocean View. We've got Regina. I believe we've seen Regina before. Welcome back. Jim. Carmen's back. Uh, Keith's back from South Africa. Hey, Golden. I remember you from last week from Fort Valley. EQ. Dean from Wisconsin. Welcome back. Another one from Maryland, David. Uh, we got someone from Germany. Hey, Klaus. Welcome, welcome. Glad you guys are here. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's any announcements. Steve hadn't made me aware of any announcements. Um, if you hadn't, uh, if you don't follow our socials or hadn't, I'm not sure if we would mentioned it on here before, but we've got the new aviator soil blend. So it's a potting soil. Uh, I came up with a recipe for people who are wanting to do seed starting at home. Uh, or potting soil, or you can use it for a uh, blocking system. Um, but we have that on our website if you want to check it out. And I'm trying to just give a few more minutes here for people to log on. Hey, Robin from Big Island. Uh, Riverwalker's back from New Mexico. Welcome, welcome. Tom from San Jose. All right. And we've got Blaine, San Antonio worm guy. First timer, welcome, good to see you. And Martin from Montreal. Several from Canada today, that's cool. I love seeing international followers and viewers. It's so awesome to me. Especially if you guys are in a time different time zone. I know for like uh, Australia, it's pretty early in the morning there. Uh, let me add this to my stream here and I'll get into it. I need to take down this banner quick. Give me one second, if I can find it. There we go, now you can be able to see. Uh, so it's March 29th, we're almost to April here and spring has fully kicked in, although we've got freezing temperatures here in Pennsylvania. Uh, coming tonight, we've got getting down to 29 degrees. Um, so today we're gonna go over prepping a worm bin or prepping a bin for worms, I should say. And let me make a big screen so I can see it better. Uh, so what we're going to go over today are the materials needed. I think most people know what the materials needed are, but just in case you're extremely new, I'll go over that. Uh, and then how to get started getting your worm bin going before you even get worms. And then uh, adding worms, it's pretty simple, but we'll go over that. And then we'll have our Q&A at the end where um, I can take any questions. It doesn't just have to be about prepping a worm bin. We can You can ask questions, vermicomposting, vermiculture worms compost, soil biology, compost tea, soil health, anything like that. All right. So as far as materials that are needed, um, you can go with an urban worm bag or another type of bin. Um, there are the stackable type bins. There are the just regular plastic, like uh, rubber made style bins that people use. Um, Usually it's going to be best, I'm not going to get into bin materials, but it's going to be best to go with something that's not going to rot like wood. Um, so plastic or um, if you're going really large, you know, metal. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to focus today on uh, urban worm bag, a stackable bin or the plastic style bin that people, um, you know, just pile stuff into and then empty out. So you're going to need a bin. And then bedding. So bedding is going to be when we talk about composting uh, for most people know about compost. And when you're making compost, we have browns and we have greens. So the greens are nitrogenous material and the browns are carbonaceous material. So our bedding is going to be made out of brown material 
or carbonaceous material, which can be shredded leaves, shredded cardboard, shredded paper, cocoa core, peat moss. Um, you can put wood chips, uh, although those are going to take a little while to break down. They're excellent to include as well. Um, but those are going to be the bedding or the carbonaceous materials that are going to balance out the green stuff that we're going to be adding. Um, so our bedding is brown material, and then we've got our foods, food scrap, uh, any type of foods, which could be food scraps. Um, some people refer to it as food waste, although it's only wasted if we waste it. Uh, so food scraps, aged manure, uh, green plant matter, or pre-composted material, if that's a new term to you, we have a whole video on pre-composting and you can go find out what that is, but it's basically putting stuff through the composting process. Uh, so any of those are going to be considered foods for worms. Uh, and we also need to realize that worms are going to be chewing through the bedding as well. Um, so everything's basically a food, uh, but the bedding makes up the bulky material that's going to uh, add some fluff and balance out that nitrogenous material. And then as far as if you're using food scraps, you just want to avoid in your worm bin, uh, not adding any meat, dairy, or things that are high in salts. Uh, some people will mention oils you know if if you're dumping a, a few tablespoons of oil from you know like if you cook in a pan uh and you have one or two tablespoons of olive oil it's not going to be that big of a deal if you're uh, dumping a little bit of oil in um it's just if you're adding lots of it and then you know things when i say high salt you know like a few dashes of salt that you're making on a meal or something like that is way different than something that's extremely high in salt, like peanut shells or anything that you know tastes extremely salty when you when you add it. Um, I knew some young ladies who had added a bunch of peanut shells, not thinking, to their worm compost and uh, came out the next morning and there were worms everywhere on the walls of their kitchen. So um, that salt robs worms and microorganisms of water and both of those things need moisture. Uh, and speaking of that, we need water. That's one of the things that we're going to need to start off with. Um, most, I think that most people that are watching are going to have access to water. Um, it's just something that's going to be part of the, of getting things going here. And then uh, you also, it's good to have a handful of soil. So just like soil from your yard or even finished compost or finished vermicompost. So those things are going to have microorganisms in them that help to uh, inoculate your new bin with these microorganisms that help to break down, excuse me, break down and decompose uh, organic matter. I'm gonna take a drink real quick. So that's all the materials needed. And we're gonna move on to getting started. So uh, here I've just got a picture of one of those Rubbermaid bins. Um, that's one of the styles, like I mentioned, I'm also going to talk about the Urban Worm Bag or the stackable style bins, which there are a variety of uh, makers of that, or I've even made up my own homemade one out of the bins that you see on the on the screen here. Uh, so if you, you want to start off with a clean bin, if you're getting an Urban Worm Bag, obviously it's going to be clean to begin with. Um, or if, you're, if you've ordered one of those stackable bins, it should not have any crap in there. But if you're using, you know, one of the plastic bins, it's likely that you've drilled out holes in there. So you just want to make sure that you're cleaning out any plastic filings so you don't have those mixed in with your vermicompost. Um, just make so, yeah, just make sure everything's clean. You know, you don't want any chemicals or oils or things like that that are in there. And then you want to take your bedding uh whether it be shredded leaves, cocoa core, shredded cardboard, something like that, and soak it uh, and then wring it out. So you could take something like a five gallon bucket, fill it with you know so much water, uh, put your material in there and let it fill up or you know take up that water and then wring it out so it's not overly soaked. Um, if you're ordering something like a cocoa core, Normally they have instructions like, you know, this size block to this amount of water, this many gallons or whatever. So you just follow the instructions on that. Otherwise, excuse me. Otherwise, you just want to make sure that um, all this stuff's moist. You don't want to, it's best to not, you know, like start off with dry card, uh, shredded cardboard, putting that into the bin and then pouring water over that because just that it's going to be hydrophobic, first of all. So it's 
gonna the water's gonna hit that and then just run down it's not gonna really soak up and then just that stuff on the bottom is gonna soak up the water where the stuff on the top is gonna remain dry whereas if you soak it ahead of time wring it out you're gonna get even moisture throughout all that material so soak your brown stuff get it wrung out uh, you want it about um the consistency of a wrung out sponge so you're not having you know a bunch of excess water when you're squeezing it and then fill your bins with brown material so if you're using an urban worm bag uh or some type of flow through unit that's very deep so the urban worm bag um doesn't have a lot of uh, horizontal stretch. You know, it's mainly a vertical tube. So you can fill that a little bit deeper to give the room, the worms plenty of room to move around and do their thing. So if you're getting, using an urban worm bag, you wanna fill it eight to 12 inches deep with this um, brown bedding. Uh, if you're using a shallow bin, um, you know, plastic bin, what, what's, what you see on the screen here, uh, you wanna fill that maybe four to six inches um, so when you were, we're giving things a good start here, we just make sure, make sure we have plenty of bedding for those worms to move around when they initially get going in the system here. We're not going to be adding this four to six inches every time. Uh, it's just to get them going. And then for the stackable bins, those are generally the stackable style aren't as deep as like what I have pictured here. So, um, fill those with about two to four inches of bedding. Again, we just want to make sure we're having nice little home that the worms can go into something that's not too thin where they're we want it something that they can bury themselves into and you know get away from light uh and move through and then uh still we don't we're not having any worms we're just putting in bedding for now and then take your food source whatever that's going to be if it's food scraps or aged manure or plant matter or a mixture of all of those coffee grounds you know whatever uh, and spread about a quarter inch layer evenly across the top of that bedding. You can mix it in a little bit if you want, um, or just make sure that you're gonna keep it, have a cover over the top so that you're not having fruit flies and stuff move in, or you can even sprinkle a little bit of bedding over the top. Uh, so that is how you're gonna get the bin started before ever even having worms in there. And then now you're ready to order your worms at this time and wait, or if you've, just ordered them that day already. You want to get the worm bin going um, because you don't need your worms on hand uh, once you have this bin ready to go here. So you can order your worms and then just wait because we want to give the worms, uh, or sorry, the uh, food scraps and that organic matter, we want to allow a micro the microbial populations to build up. So there are bacteria and fungi already on the surfaces of foods, and you're going to have more bacteria and fungi that move in from the air. And especially this is why we inoculate our bins with a handful of uh, soil from outside or previously made compost or vermicompost, um, because it's going to help to put these populations in place. And then they're going to move onto the surfaces of your banana peels and apple cores and things like that and start to uh, work down at them work away at them, I should say, and decompose them. So um, yeah, in a compost system, any compost system, vermicompost, regular compost, the microorganisms are what are actually doing the decomposition. Worms and any higher um, organisms are going to just be helping to break those things down and shred them down into smaller sizes. Uh, so uh, put the food in there, wait a few days to a week to allow those microbial populations to build. If you happen to see some mold forming, that's really not going to be a big deal. Mold is just a type of fungi that's going to help to break things down. Um, any, you know, any type of growth that you see there is really not going to be that big of a deal. It's just things that have moved in to start and decompose things. Uh, so once you're wait, once you've waited a few days to a week to get those microbial populations build up. Um, one thing to add as well, uh, just a note, is that when worms eat things, they are chewing through cardboard or leaves or food bits and stuff like that. They're actually getting their nutrition from um, especially protozoa. So protozoa eat bacteria and worms eat protozoa and they're getting their nutrients from that protozoa. So that's one of the main reasons that we not, uh, need to allow that microbial buildup so that the worms have things that they can get nutrition from. So we've waited that period, allowed that buildup to take place, and then we want to put our worms in the bin. 
Um, you know, there's no necessarily special way to do this. You know, you probably don't want to drop it from several feet up, but, you know, kind of gently get them out into the bin. Um, and then I like to mist them. And I finally remember to grab my mister. I'm always talking about this thing. So uh, it's labeled a multi-purpose sprayer. And I think it holds like two liters. Yeah, two liters of water. And it's, you can get it. I got this at Ace Hardware. You can get it at a hardware store or online. You pump it up with water and then spray it out. It's got an adjustable nozzle here so you can get a stream to a nice mist. Uh, these work awesome. And if you're going to be, if you're planning on keeping worms for a while, I would definitely uh, get one of those. So um, your worms have likely dried out a little bit through shipping and things like that. And it's going to benefit them to get a good mist of water. It's going to help their health. So place your bins, uh, sorry, place your worms into the bin give them a good mist. You know, you don't need to soak them down too much. They just need a little bit of water. Um, and then depending on the type of, it's depending on the type of worm, you have red wigglers are more likely to stay in a bin, uh, whereas others are likely to hop out or want to leave, I should say, not necessarily immediately. Um, you can leave a light on for 12 hours, 24 hours, and that's gonna help to get those worms to drive down into the material and really want to stay down in there instead of escaping since it's kind of a new habitat for them. Uh, and then just allow the worms to settle in for a few days. Um, people are really wanting to check on them all the time and it's really best to just kind of leave worms to do their own thing uh, and not check on them so much. Um, it's not going to be a major deal if you're checking on them once a day. Uh, but especially that first feeding, you know, you first introduced your worms they're getting used to a whole new home, just like if you move to a whole new city, it takes you a while to really get settled and um, kind of feel comfortable. Same thing with worms. They need a few days to get settled and feel comfortable in their new habitat. Uh, so they may not, you may not notice a lot of activity of the of decomposition or your food scraps moving around or anything like that. But once they get settled, they'll start to work away at that and chew through things. Um, so that initial putting the worms in and allowing them to eat may you may want to wait one or two weeks before adding food whereas from then on they're going to be adjusted and they're going to be comfortable and things will move a bit more quickly so that's just kind of for the initial feeding there um and then i think we're back to our q a here so i will get out of here and take any questions that you all have um let me get to the comments and let me get this off of the screen uh, give me just a second here. I got to go up into the comments to see if I missed any questions here. Lots of hellos. Someone, uh, Golden asks, should new bedding be added to the top of an established bin or mixed in? How can you tell if you have too many castings in a bin for it to be healthy for worms? Um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out exactly what you're asking in the first part of that question there. Should new adding be added to the top of an established bin or mixed in? Uh, if you're adding new bedding along with food material, um, we have a whole video on that. Uh, actually, there's a couple of different videos. One of them I was going to even recommend if you guys have any questions about feeding. We have um, a past live stream called Chef Troy RD's Worm Feeding Tips or something like that. Um, but what I generally like to do is if we're mixing in, I recommend usually two browns to two parts browns to one parts greens when I'm adding new foods into the bin. So you could mix one to one, put that in and then take your other brown, one part brown and put that on the top or at least leave a little bit so that you're adding a thin layer of brown stuff on top of your food. Um, because if you've got exposed banana peels or any type of fruits like that, you're more likely to attract or get uh, fungus gnats and fruit flies and things like that or other pest material they're not necessarily pests, but um, things that people may consider pests. Uh, but keeping a, keeping brown stuff over your foods is gonna limit that. And then uh, he said also, how can you tell if you have too many castings in a bin? Um, once every, once most of the stuff gets it to a consistency of like um, coffee grounds or about that size, then you know that they're ready to harvest. Uh, you can't, 
necessarily i mean there comes a point where you can leave them too for too long but i mean if you neglect a bin for four months or six months um the worms are just going to go back through and chew through the castings that they've already put out and it's not going to be a huge deal uh and i've like right now it's been maybe a couple months since i fed my worms um and they'll just make things finer and finer and better and better uh, but, and again, there can be, I mean, if you're leaving things for nine months or a year, you're going to, they're going to start to need more nutrients than that. And it's likely going to start drying up. So you're going to have to give some attention to them. Hello from Sweden. Welcome. I don't know if we've had anybody from Sweden before, unless you've been here before and I hadn't noticed. Uh, another question from Golden. Do you need to aerate an established bin by mixing and fluffing the contents? Um, if it's stinky and smelly like anaerobic i would any type of foul smells i would aerate it otherwise um you shouldn't need to mix things and fluff them up if, if it's an established bin um da -da -da -da. someone said to start the bin i ask new worm parents i don't know think this is a question uh worm parents to blend some food first use what wet blended food to wet and prepare the first cardboard uh yeah that works too you can blend up some food and mix it in um, then it's already smaller particle size for them to eat more easily. Can you use just worm castings for seedlings? Uh, no. And we have a whole live stream about that, Wiggle Wednesday about that too as well. Um, you want to stick to 20% of the volume or less. And I'll let you go check out that video. If I get a chance, I'll put the video in the comment section here so that you can check it out. But it's on our Urban Worm channel on YouTube. Uh, you just click on the live tab. And you can see that whole video. Uh, Dream, River Dreamwalker says, um, I have a two tray hot frog worm bin. I have no bugs or odors. Do I need extra trays? I give my worm molasses to track them from the bottom tray to the top tray. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a little unsure uh, what, why you would need extra trays. I mean, if you've got three trays, you should be fine. Um, by the time they're getting into the middle and the top one, then that bottom one should be done. Uh, so it shouldn't be that big of a deal to not have extra trays. Um, I'm not sure if I'm understanding you correctly, though. If I'm using city tap water, how long should I leave one gallon water out to dechlorinate it? Or is that important to do? Um, I usually recommend only being too concerned about dechlorinating water if you smell chlorine um, if you're smelling it in your water then it's going to be pretty strong and you should probably let it off gas uh, by letting it sit out for a day or putting uh, a bubbler on it for 12 hours otherwise it's not going to be super important uh, someone says i'm recently interested in cocoon bins what's the difference between regular bin and cocoon bins i believe you're talking about breeder bins uh, so there are worm bins where people are trying to produce uh, vermicompost or, or vermicast, worm castings. And then there are people who are trying to breed worms in order to sell worms or increase their population so that they can um, start more bins. And so that's why people have breeder bins. Uh, and we went into that last week in the week of Wednesday last week. Uh, what about pit moss? Uh, the good one. Yeah, I forgot to mention pit moss. Thank you for mentioning that. So pit moss is a, a product that is made out of shredded. Um, I don't know. I guess you call it shredded. It's even more than that. It's kind of shredded and fluffed old newspaper. Um, uh, I guess I didn't I guess I didn't throw it in there because you have to spend money on it. Normally I'm looking for free things. So you can go outside and get free leaves or you can get free newspaper or free uh, cardboard anywhere. Um, if, if for some reason you all don't have news, don't get a newspaper, you know, like at the grocery store, after you check out and go out the door, there's always those free newspapers or at your grocery store, instead of getting plastic bags, if you don't reuse reusable bags, you can ask for brown paper bags. Those are great for worm bedding and shred those up in a shredder. Um, there's free cardboard everywhere or in the autumn, people leave bags of leaves out on their curb. You can just go by and pick them up and take them home and store them. Uh, so there's all kinds of free ways to get brown stuff. Uh, but pit moss is a good product and um, 
there is a uh, I, they should have a website called pitmoss.com, I believe. Um, they actually just sent me a sa sample of stuff not too long ago. Uh, Evil Genius says, I'm feeling confident about my new worm bin, but anything I should be watching for it to have continued success. Um, if you've read the basics, I would, um, I mean, I usually suggest uh, Mary Applehoff's book, if you haven't read it, uh, Worms Eat My Garbage, and especially that and uh, Rhonda Sherman's book, The Worm Farmer's Handbook. Um, other than that, you can stay tuned to our Wiggle Wednesday every uh, every Wednesday. Um, trying to think. Cap Captain Matt's got good information on YouTube, too. Um, I rarely send people to YouTube because there are so many amateurs on there. So um, I, I prefer books and things that are written by experts. Uh, soaking or washing high salt scraps like peanuts allowed to use in the bin. Uh, mm, with peanut shells, I would still be pretty weary because they they have normally been soaked in like a brine, so I would still be afraid that it might be too salty. Um, I would just likely throw it out and use it kind of as a mulch in the garden or something like that. <laughs> Someone said, I've had this said before, worms don't chew. Uh, it's just an easy expression to in some so I don't have to use the word process all the time or whatever. Uh, worms don't have teeth and they don't chew. They swallow material. And then just like a chicken they have a, or other birds, they have gizzards that uh, break the material down. So um, the worm chew is just an analogy for other things because I run out of other words. Is spraying water mixed with molasses a good idea to get the microbes going or will it make more bacterial dominant? Um, a worm bin is going to be pretty much have bacteria in it in it anyway. Uh, I wouldn't worry about spreading molasses on stuff because you're going to have a good amount of uh, bacterial populations in there anyway. And just uh, making sure things are moist are going to help to keep those populations up because uh, microorganisms need that moisture. Uh, question, how do I use wheat? How do I use wheatless grass seed? I have no idea what you're talking about. I was told I needed to get these. Um, I, I don't know what that is. I apologize, but I'm not able to answer that question. Um, I, Evil Genius says, I have 100 red wigglers from Brothers in a 20-gallon bin. What do I think? That sounds... Uh, uh, it, anytime you're using worms to compost you want to focus on the square foot of surface area so i don't know how big your 20 gallon bin is it could be a 20 gallon bin that's you know got a bunch of surface area or it could be a 20 gallon bin that's you know more vertical so you want uh the recommended uh ratio is a pound of worms or about a thousand red wigglers uh or other worms for every square foot of surface area that you have in a bin uh, thanks for all the good reminders, TJ says. Thank you, TJ. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll look back for breeder bin episodes. Arbartra, I hope I'm saying that correctly. When does demand for castings usually start and end? Uh, I'm guessing you mean the market demand for castings. Uh, it would. Uh, you, it depends on who you're selling to. Um, there are, you know, indoor growers who are selling year round, so that demand's gonna be there year round, or if you're working with um, market farmers or gardeners and things like that, obviously the very early spring, um, they're looking to get things started in January and February, depending on what uh, what zone you're in, but normally in ar around that time. So um, the spring, it, yeah, it depends on who you're selling it to. Oh, my city water works uses chloramine i dechlorinate with eighth uh teaspoon of common absorbic acid to five gallons of tap water uh there wasn't a question there um instead of absorbic you can use absorbic acid or you can use humic acid humic acid is a thing that's already in the soil so um why not use humic acid since it's something that's uh prevalent in soils already and humic acid has another number of other benefits including to help uptake nutrients uh, growing with Matt asks, what are the possibilities for my worms trying to leave my bin? 
uh, man, there's a lot of variables that could, uh, it depends on your worms. It depends on, you know, what's going on in the bin. So, uh, there's too many answers to that question. Um, that would be maybe a good episode we could cover in the future are reasons that worms would leave a bin. So I'll make a note of that and maybe we can cover that. Golden asks, can worms produce quality, ca quality castings on a diet of leaves only? What's the best diet for high quality castings? Um, I'm making a note real quick here. One second. I would say that uh, it's better to at least have a few different types of foods. So a good diversity of foods is going to provide a diversity of nutrients and micronutrients along with the diversity of microorganisms. So leaves, even if there's, you know, maple leaves, oak leaves, and different types of leaves, um, they're not going to have a great diversity. Uh, they're mainly going to be carbon. They're not going to have a great diversity of microorganisms as well. So, um, I mean, you could make a vermicompost. It's probably going to be decent, but things would be a lot better if you had a, a varied diet for your worms. Uh, Evil Genius asks, I'm after the worm castings, but would like to take some soil and use in my pots. How do I know without removing worm baby eggs? Um, if you're sifting castings, which we just th went, that was last week's episode, was removing or harvesting worm castings. So um, you can check out last week's episode. Uh, once you've sifted your castings, if you're wanting to use them in pots, um, you know, you're going to have to harvest out the worm castings if you don't want those eggs in your grow pots, but it's not going to be a big deal if you happen to put some cocoons in with a, you know, a plant, a potter, a potted plant. Uh, Kay says, I always use cardboard for my bin that I have it in my house. I started using leaves. Would that kind of be risky for pests in my house? Um, once you start using more stuff from nature, you're going to be bringing in other things that are in nature, which uh, nature doesn't, isn't a monoculture. Um, so your worm bin is not going to be a monoculture. Uh, even if a lot of people only think that there should be worms there, there's going to be more than that. So you're going to have springtails, uh, roly polies, millipedes, and things like that. And especially if you're bringing in leaves, you're more likely to bring those things into your worm bins. But, but Again, those things are helping to break things down further and decompose them. So all they're doing is to working to assist worms, and all those things are helping to assist microorganisms, where which are helping working to break things down. Um, River Dreamwalker asks, "Will colored paper hurt the worms since they don't use lead ink anymore?" Um, if it, I would not use any shiny paper. So if it's like a newspaper uh where you've got the the dull finish like of a newspaper with colored ink they generally use soy ink now so those are okay but like a catalog where it's glossy shiny paper excuse me glossy shiny paper i would not use those types of things uh next question should you start out with eggshells or similar material in the bin uh you know what? You reminded me that I totally forgot to mention that. Uh, you do want to add a little bit of grit. I, I appreciate you uh, asking that question because I completely neglected to uh, put that in there when you're working with a bin. So when you're first getting a bin started, you want to add, which we had that a few episodes back as well, was grit. Um, you can use sand or, again, um, when I mentioned putting in a handful of soil from your uh, yard, that um, I had mentioned how that's going to incorporate and inoculate with microorganisms, but I neglected to mention that that soil from your yard is going to help to add uh, uh, grit for your worms. So they don't need a ton. You can just put it in there in the very beginning. You don't need to be adding it every feeding. Um, we did a whole episode on that, so you guys can check out that episode as far as grit goes. But um, yeah, if you're using a handful of soil to get your worm bin started, that soil is going to have grit in there. Or you can grab a little bit of sand from a creek bed or something like that. Or you can sh ground up eggshells. Um, there's a question, is there a market for worm gizzards? <laughs> Fried chicken gizzard is tasty. Uh, you'd have to eat a lot, uh, and worms are pretty expensive these days, so that would be quite costly. Uh, but maybe it's a maybe it's a startup. 
uh, how many worms to start an urban worm bag. Um, you know, I honestly don't have the number in my head of what the, the um, square footage of the urban worm bag is. Steve's not here to give me that number, but I believe it's about two square feet, if I had to guess, uh, two to three square feet. So that would be two to three pounds of worms. Uh, that's a number I should know. Uh, uh, that's a number I should have memorized, so I apologize. I don't. Uh, question, can I use perlite in organic gardening? Um, yeah, you can use perlite in organic gardening. Uh, it's probably good to look for something that is um, especially marked, uh, depending on where, where you are in the United States. We have OMRI, O-M-R-I, and so the things are OMRI approved. They're okay for organic standards. Uh, Mike said, who needs books? We have you guys. Best info going. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. My information is coming from books, so you know that you're getting quality information. Uh, can I add earthworms to my red wiggler bins? Um, I think we maybe did an episode about different types of worms in a bin. So um, we did expect, we did definitely do an episode about the different types uh, or how composting worms are different from other types of worms. So things like uh, night crawlers that you use for fishing are not going to be the same as composting worms. So um, composting worms are epigeic worms, meaning that they live, if this is the soil surface, they live above the soil surface in that leaf litter layer or in that litter layer above the soil surface. They don't live down in the soil. Whereas if you're using the term earthworm, most people I would believe would use the term earthworm for things that live more in the earth. So um, it's not like they're going to be bad. It's just that they're they're going to help out. Um, you, they're not necessarily made for those conditions. Those is what I'm trying to say. But it's not necessarily going to be a bad thing. All right. Uh, next question is saying if baby worms end up in my pots, it's okay. Yeah, it's absolutely fine if baby worms end up in your pots. Um, they may not survive for a real long time. They're going to have to have some organic matter to survive on, but at a certain point they may die off, but it's not going to be a big deal. Would it be better to pulverize banana peels and watermelon? Um, yeah, so anytime you can increase surface area by chopping things up or whatever. So, uh, I mean, most people have made observations. If you were to just take a banana peel and throw it down on the ground versus cutting up the banana peel and throwing that on the ground, the cut up banana peel is going to decompose a lot faster. You're exposing more surface area to the air and in the air are bacteria and fungi, which are going to move in and break those things down. So if you can cut things up, uh, and put them into your worm bin, it's going to be, it's going to decompose quicker, more quickly than uh, leaving, you know, a full banana peel or whatever. Josh asks, are there any concerns using sawdust beyond cedar for bedding? Um, I mentioned it a number of times, but sawdust has an extremely high, just like cedar, has an extremely high carbon to nitrogen ratio. Uh, so you would think that sawdust, because it's so broken down that it would break down very easily because it's such a small particle size. But once you make it into sawdust, for some reason, that makes that carbon to nitrogen ratio extremely high. And so it takes a long time to break down. So you can incorporate it um, and it's going to get dark and you're likely going to not even notice that it's there. But it, in reality, it's going to take a long time to break down. Uh, four square feet. Thank you. Thanks for that answer. Oh, wait. I've got two different ones. Two by two, yeah, so it's four square feet. Thank you. I've never actually measured my urban worm bag. I uh, Just that's one thing I have not done. What about those melting packing worms that maybe are cornstarch? Um, yeah, the packing peanuts that melt away. Uh, I don't think they're made out of cornstarch. I don't think that it's going to be that big of a deal to put into your worm bin. Um, but once they hit water, they just shrink right away anyway. So, um, and the, the cornstarch is just going to be kind of some food for bacteria. So either way, it's not going to be bad. Um, and I'm coming up to the last question, unless anybody adds anything else. Evil genius. I heard African nightcrawlers are better than regular red wigglers at composting. Uh, there's a, there's some variables in there to consider, Red wigglers are most commonly chosen because they can 
they are able to adapt and um, withstand large fluctuations in temperature and things like that. Whereas African night crawlers need uh, a more consistent and warm temperature. So uh, if you're someone who um, it, it's, if you're, if you're just strictly looking at composting and they have the um, ultimate conditions, then African night crawlers are going to process things quick more quickly than uh, generally more quickly than red wigglers. So if you had the same temperature, if you were like 80 degrees and had one pound of red wigglers versus one pound of African night crawlers and gave them the food, same food sources, those African night crawlers are going to work through that stuff and turn that into vermicompost more quickly than the red wigglers. But there's a lot of other instances that can make red wigglers better than African night crawlers. So if you're a person who doesn't have a climate controlled area to keep your worm bin or something like that, your African night crawlers aren't going to do well because if it's getting down to 50, 60 degrees in that area and it's getting cooler, the African night crawlers aren't going to want that. So uh, as far as being able to work through things quick, more quickly, yes, they can, but there's a lot of other more things to consider. Uh, da -da -da -da. Uh, Evil Genius says, so don't play with your worms every day. That's correct. We'll go blind. I use a disposable sink in the shed to pulverize my items to put in the worm bin. Uh, yeah, so there was the question about, you know, um, pulverizing or, or um, oh, what's the word? Uh, a blend, blending food scraps. It's, it's always going to be good to increase the surface area, but I've warned before in another episode if you're to like blend up and may basically turn stuff into a smoothie and then you know if you've got a square bin like this and you pour all that smoothie mixture over top of your bin it kind of creates a seal it can create a seal on the top where there's no air movement and it can be um, detrimental to your worms so if you're doing that you want to make sure and put just like strips of food across your bin and not make sure and not cover the whole thing or little tiny piles mixed around where air can still flow in other areas. Uh, someone asked, can I add vermiculite to a worm bin? Yes, that's not going to be any issue to add vermiculite to a worm bin. Uh, so it's, I want to check on my worms every 30 days, only 100 worms. I wonder how much they will eat in that time. Uh, it, it's There's a lot of variables in that as well. So um, temperatures and with only 100 worms, they're not going to process a lot. Do roly polies eat worms? No, roly polies do not eat worms. Uh, the only thing that you have to be concerned about, the main things you have to be concerned about in a worm bin are centipedes and red mites. Uh, I think that's it. I can't think of anything else. Thanks, Keith, for the compliment. Thanks for all the kind words. Um, it looks like we're out of questions and we're about at a quarter to the hour here. Uh, thank you one, everyone for joining in. Um, Golden just mentioned top with a question mark, but I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, if you can, uh, add a question in the next sec 10 seconds here, I'll answer it quickly. Otherwise I am going to sign off. Thank you everyone. Next week's topic. Um, so I've done an episode on compost tea in the past and next week I was plan I'm planning on doing compost extract. And I think that Steve should be cool with that. Uh, I'll run it by him, but, um, otherwise next week I'll plan on doing compost extract. So a liquid compost that you can make from your worm compost and, uh, add fertility to your gardens and plants. Um, one, one question. Quick question before I say goodbye. Are boiled potatoes all right for worms? Yeah, boiled potatoes as long as they're cooled down. Um, the starches are going to help to feed bacteria, which are going to help to feed protozoa, which are going to help to feed the worms. All right, with that, I will sign off. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending. Thanks for watching. Um, I will see you next week and Wednesday, and have a blessed week. Take it easy. Until next Wednesday. Thank you.